Charlotte, and many thanks to all of you for joining us from all over the world today to share stories on community-led nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation, or some of us call ecosystem-based adaptation. We also look forward to discuss with all of you what we can learn from those community-led nature-based solutions for building back better from COVID. The session is co-organized and supported by 12 amazing partners who have brought a diversity of experience and expertise from Asia Pacific, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. It probably take me two minutes to read all the names, so I'm just going to post it into the chat box so you can see. We also look forward to learning from all of you by making this session as interactive as possible through Mentimeter, dedicated breakout room interactions and a chat. So as a start, please do introduce yourself in the chat box to everyone if you haven't done so already. And I'm Xiaoting Ho Jones, senior researcher at IED, and I'll be your moderator today. And sorry if you see me darting my eyes and uh, switching my head all over the place. This is mainly because I'm monitoring various chat and uh, uh, with you, with, um, with the participants, with all the speakers, so it gets a little bit chaotic sometimes. Um, and I think we all know that COVID, and actually this meeting is the result of COVID, that we were going to meet in person, but we actually meet virtually. So it has really impacted all of us in very different ways. It has exposed some of the entrenched vulnerability and inequality in our society and showed how challenges like climate change, biodiversity loss, the and pandemic and the risk to public health are also interlinked. So for example, COVID disproportionately impact already marginalized and the poor communities as they may lack access to medical and social services. They are also more vulnerable to sharp price changes in local markets, disrupted food supply chains, and job and income losses. But on the other hand, COVID has also revealed some useful lessons on how we can build a better future where we society is more prepared to adapt and respond to risks like pandemic and climate change. We have also seen, as you seen in some of the photos, if you were here with us earlier, how working with nature to build communities' long-term resilience to climate change is also helping communities to be more resilient to many of the pandemic's impact. So leading up to the session, we worked with members of the FIBA network to collect inspiring stories from communities. So you have seen some of the photos um, and the videos before, and we will, Eve, maybe you can post the link to the Flickr account so people can also view it after the session. But coming back for today's session, we will start by sharing stories from three communities. We hope you will also share your stories in the chat box and the latest through Mentimeter exercise. We will then have a panel of local governments and a policy expert to start us off on a discussion on how we can learn from those community stories to inform policies to build back better from COVID. We hope all those stories and discussions then can help pave the way for more in-depth discussion among all of you in the breakout rooms. We will not have a lengthy report back in the plenary afterwards, but again, we'll try to use Mentimeter to pour your reflections before we close the session. So just a final reminder that one of the few advantages of not meeting in person, but virtually is that it gives us different options to engage with each other and allow more conversation to flow in this short 19 minutes. So throughout the session, please feel free to share reflections, ask questions to each other and the speakers via the chat box and this session, as well as the chat box content, will then be recorded and shared on Hoover platform after the session. So do interact with each other whatever way you feel comfortable. So that's enough from me uh, for now. And we really want to hear from the community themselves first. Jenna, could you start preparing the video, please? So first, we will hear from Mrs. Xiu Yingzhang, a farmer and a plant breeder from Yunnan, China. She will tell us her story through a recorded video produced by China Pharmacy Network, who has been supporting showing and her communities in China. Showing and the colleagues from China Pharmacy Network actually with us in the session today. Showing, maybe you can just wave your hand so some participants may be able to see you. Unfortunately, Showing doesn't speak English, and many of us here, I assume, don't speak Chinese. So the video is prepared to help us overcome this translation challenge. So, uh, Jenna, could you please play the video, please? The 
发呗，拉拉要做什么？嗯，俺个祖国个越南丽江个老婆那娃，我咋休息呢？你发呗，拉拉要发。目前我在做玉主，农民玉主工作。当时我们村里的话就没有太注视这个保护传统品种的这件事情，慢慢的把这些传统品种流失的比较多。后面就呃，我们中科院的宋老师、宋一清老师来了石头采之后，就呃给我们讲了呃传统品种的重要性，然后我们。我就开始做这个保护传统品种的这个事情搞起来，就从一三年开始就做这个保育工作。慢慢的，就天气变化的特别快，每一年不是前期干旱，就后期下雨下个不停，呃，要不。前期下雨就后期干旱，有气候就是每一年的变化都特别不一样的在变化。而且这个玉米早交批处种下去就没有一定的下雨和湿度的话，就根本结不了瓣。但传统批处的话，就是种起就至少也会结一个瓣，因为有。记得看看汉戏吧，我觉得可以是给大家分享一下的，就是黑玉米，因为它的颜色有最最大就不一样。呃，这一个是秀云一号，呃，这个也是嫩性的，然后种出来的口感也比较好，就是可以做酸梅汤、宝石饮料。我的这个合作社的名字也是宝贵的宝，食物的食。食物是比较宝贵的，其实我们的饮食不是很复杂的，做出来的比较简单才是真实的。土产，还有沃墨、老白、油米，有四个社区组成一个网络。呃，这个网络之后，呃，石土城的这些组织一大沃墨在交流。还有试住，后来就慢慢移到了老白，老白这个点。我一直在做这个保育的这个事情，一个是遗传的基因吧，因为我爸爸也喜欢做留主的这一块。然后遇到了中科院的那个宋一清老师以后，他又给我上了一堂课，一带一个可以应对我们的气候。我自己做了一个主持课，还有我们宝山社呃石土城社区也建了个种植银行，还是在家里自己建个主持课更有比较直接，随时可以拿到地里可以循环种植。目前积累的有一百来株，呃，玉米有五十几株，小麦七八株。还有水稻一七八种，还有蔬菜类、呃，豆类这些都有。我村里的这些姐妹也在做做我的这些传统品种，然后比较稳定的这些才分享给村里的这些姐妹。疫情期间，我在我的种子库里也足够可以分享给大家，也没什么太大的影响。种子像生命一样，呃，有了一个的，一个人的生命一样，有了一种种子的话，所以我一直在保留这个传统品种，这是已经是七年，我一直在这里。Thanks so much for showing and China's pharmacy network for such an inspiring story that shows how community-based diverse seed banks not only help communities deal with climate change, but also help them ensure access to seeds for sowing during COVID-19. The, I think there's also a hidden story there uh, of the importance of women for championing nature-based solution. 
So the last frame of the video, if you remember, shows many of the active women farmers who are true champions of nature-based solutions. They care for their seeds, their family, their community, and are willing to work together. So they're carrying nature and a long-term vision and a genuine concern and love for the environment they live in and the culture they have is what has been going this collective efforts of working in na with nature to adapt to climate change in China. So now we will travel from the mountains in Yunnan into the rural Nepal. Next, Mr. Namao Adahikari will be our next storyteller. He's a program manager from Kanchan Nepal, a sister NGO of the International Ring Harvesting Alliance. Mr. Namao is an expert in water resource management in rural communities. Over to you, Namao. Namaste everyone. My name is Nirmal Adhikari. I'm working at Kanchan Nepal for International Rainwater Harvesting Alliance as a program coordinator. We have been working together since 2013 in Nepal. Uh, as the start of COVID pandemic, Kanchan Nepal were providing local water resources for schools, homes, and farms. We helped community harvest rainwater we help channel rainwater flow access across the land. Well managed rainwater resources can be used for drinking, hygiene and sanitation purposes, and even for farming. With the spread of COVID-19, it's vital for hand hygiene, especially, yeah. <clears throat> and Kansas Nepal set the benchmark for rainwater harvesting in school in our region. We built rainwater harvesting system in nine school in Kaski district. So children have water tap and do not have to work to a spring to collect the water. We run educational activities at this school to teach children about natural processes. Children planted more than thousand saplings and watched them grow in their uh, school premises. They learned that open defecation defecation also affect lo local water quality. This year, we will construct our 10th blue schools in Kaski. In one of, uh, in one of our blue school, Bishop Santi Higher Secondary School is being used as a quarantine facility during this COVID-19 pandemic. It, well, it has a water tank that can hold over 40,000 liters of water. The rainwater feeds toilet and tapes for hand washing. The resources have been used by communi communities when they rebuilt after a recent earthquake and at the election of our school were pulling station. The viruses is bring people back to Kaski. The field in our rural community are cultivated by more hands. But people coming from coming home from the cities are more likely to transmit the virus in our communities. So local authority asks them to quarantine at Bishosanti before they go to their families. <clears throat> During our Blue School program, community realized the benefit of rainwater harvesting. They want to use rainwater for irrigation as well as for drinking. We are working to retain more rainwater in catchment. We draw on local indigenous knowledge to combat water scarcity in middles. Using this knowledge, we are restoring ancient pokeries ponds to plant rain in ground work, in rain in the ground, creating local nurseries and reforesting barren slopes. This water wisdom helps community to care for themselves now and beyond this COVID crisis. Thank you, Namaste. Hello. Yeah, hi, Namal. Yes, please. Uh, this is the things uh, that uh, I would like to share about these uh, uh, Nepal activities that recently are done in Kaski district from Nepal. Yeah? In, uh, it's a mountainous country, you know, so we have a different methodology to um, adapt with uh, natural based technology and natural based uh, activities.
Thank you. Great. Thanks, Namal, for those beautiful photos and really bring us to your communities to see how they're caring for trees and helping each other. And I, I think this, again, was a nice gender message in the first story. And here there's a youth being involved by getting the schools also prepared to join you in those integrated water management activities to help the community to access water and in drought, but also during COVID for hygiene purposes and helping the young and educated the young to champion the nature-based solution in future. So it's really great. And then next, we would want to welcome Mrs. Musonda Kapena. Uh, she will take us all the way from the mountains in Asia to the drylands and forests in Africa. Musonda is the Chief Executive Officer from Zambia National Forest Commodity Association, which support local forest communities in Zambia. Musonda has over 20 years experience working with those lo local communities. So we're really looking forward to hearing from her. Musonda, over to you. Thank you very much, Zhao Ting. Um, my name is Musonda, as Zhao Ting has said, and I would like to say that I'm very grateful to be online with everybody and I hope that everybody can understand my English. Um, the people of Africa have for a long time used indigenous knowledge systems as their way of being resilient to shocks, shocks from the climate change issues and shocks from all kinds of other causes. Um, Climate change is already impacting Africa very, very badly. And for Zambia, it has impacted the Zambian communities in a very large way as well. And as such, we need to take stock and account for the losses, but at the same time, what the Zambia National Forest Commodity Association does is that we work with our forest-based communities to remind each other on what indigenous knowledge systems have been used in the past and how those can be remembered and used now in prosperity for the future. As such, urgent need is needed, urgent action is needed to properly sustainably manage our natural environment. As you can see from this slide, there's an old man. Most of the old people in the villages are the source of information we have. He's able to identify what is already commonly used in the um, communities as solutions for the COVID and for other ailments that have come on board due to climate change. The next slide, please. In this slide, it continues to show that we we've acknowledged that we don't have any new information to share with the communities. Instead, we are using the indigenous knowledge systems approach where we sit through community conversations with the women and the men and ask them how they survived in the past in times of drought and in, and in times of floods. Right now with COVID, it's amazing to learn that most people are using ash from their cooking stoves as a hand sanitizer. And you can see from the same slide that there's a collection of herbs, which is used as, an, as a herbal infusion to steam their bodies each time they come from activities in the urban areas, or each time they come into contact with urban dwellers. This is being cognizant of the fact that COVID in Zambia was more widespread in the urban areas than it was in the rural areas. So our learning point there is that what is being done right in the rural areas that we need to do across the country to protect ourselves from um, COVID and from other emergent um, diseases and shocks that may have come about through the effects of climate change. Next slide, please. From here, we are learning that um, the use of the Masao fruit, Masao in botanical terms is called Zizipus mauritiana, or in short, the Indian jujube. This particular forest fruit has a lot of micronutrients which should not be taken for granted. 
the people of the Luangwa Valley have used this fruit for time immemorial as a supplement to vitamins as an, and also as a very strong immune booster. They are able to harvest it sustainably and to dry it in the sun and later on to pound it and make a paste, which then can be stored with a shelf life of 12 months. So this is then used as a sweetener, as an immune booster, and it's able to be eaten from the babies to the old people. What this has done is that though they may not be food due to the droughts which Malawi and Zambia faced in the last rainy season, they are able to still supplement their diets with the nutrients that are needed. They don't have to go into the pharmacies like the urban people have. They just go into the forest as their pharmacy and pluck what their ancestors ate. I was privileged to eat some of it and it's very, very nutritious. So what we have done as an association is that we are looking at value addition to see exactly how these foods and forest supplements can be packaged and stored for sale in urban areas and across the country as a natural source of vitamins, micronutrients and antibodies good enough to preserve ourselves against diseases like COVID-19 and anything else that may come due to the effects of climate change. Next slide, please. We're also working very well with the rural communities of the Luangwa Valley, the Gwembe Valley, and the Luano Valley, where we have a lot of tamarind. Tamarind is a very resilient forest fruit, which has over 50 uses. In the local languages, we call it Wusika, we call it Uwembe, or we call it Kawawasha. This also has a long shelf life and it has multiple uses um, ranging from edible to commercial. It, it, um, it, in some areas, it's also used as an antiseptic hand wash or as a wound dressing. So what we have done as an association in collaboration with FAO under the Forest and Farm Facility Program is that we are looking at value addition to be able to package the, these particular fruits, as you can see from the picture, into marketable products, which will then be a very strong supplement for not just for eating as, as a food or as a juice or as a sweetener or as a jam, but also as a soap, as an antiseptic, and as whatever else that it can be used for. And as I said at the beginning, we're not teaching them anything new. We have taken the step of the learners and the community is our mentor. They know exactly about the shelf life, they know about the handling. The only interventions which we are going in with is to assist them with the primary processing so that it's hygienic and efficient, and also to remind certain communities where they were actually cutting down the trees and um, harvesting in that way to start harvesting sustainably. That way we'll be able to share this treasure, not only within Zambia, but across Africa in a methodology of reminding each other what our forefathers did that we have forgotten to do and we believe as an association that that's the only way to have sustainable mitigation against climate change and the shocks that come with it. So um, from the Zambian National Forest Commodity Association, we believe that these value addition processes are possible and that they are sustainable because it all starts with the forest communities and the market is all over the world across Africa and across the whole world as a nature-based solution. Nature-based solutions are basically there for us to remind each other on what ecological ways are possible for us to face the shocks that we have experienced, not just because of COVID-19, but because of unsustainable development that is going on, not only in Zambia, but across the globe as well. I'd like to thank you all for listening and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Enjoy the day.
Thanks so much, Musonda. It's really inspiring to hear diversified income from diversified value added for its product can make local community more resilient to climate change. But also interesting to hear that with those diversified herbs and the forest product, that also means they have a more diversified use. So the sanitizer, the herb both sanitizers for rural communities in COVID is a really good example. And I think both you and uh, also showing also showed us the importance of traditional knowledge and uh, learning from uh, decades of experience or centuries of experience of working with nature to adapt to change is really important. So now we want to hear from all of you. So Jenna, if you can go to next slide, please. So we're pulling exercise in Mentimeter. So please go to menti.com and enter the digits 5374674 and use up to three words to describe how nature has helped you or the communities you work with to adapt to climate change and cope with COVID-19. The question and the Menti code is displayed on the slide. If you don't work directly with any communities, you're also welcome to draw on the speaker's stories to shape your answers. So if everyone could do that, and we should see the polling result coming in on the slide. And if you have any questions on how to do that, do feel free to ask in the chat box. Hi, Jenna, have you enabled the result to show? Yes, it should be. Hmm. Sorry, this is one of the incidences where technologies we need to yeah, I do have it on. Uh, one moment. So while Jenna try to get to the Mentimeter slides ready, please keep on entering your inputs. We'll try to get take a moment to load that slide. And with that, I just don't want to really delay the session too much. So um, while Jenna loading the slide. It's saying it's loading. It could take a moment. Yeah, Let's... please do bear with us. And at the same time, um, I did see some spe some questions for the speakers as well. So Namal, I think there will be a question for you. So do feel free to respond to some of the questions in the chat box as well. And, and at the same time, I just want to say the next step in the uh, session, since we have heard some of the evidence and experience showing that the community champion nature-based solutions can help us not only adapt to climate change, but also respond better to other societal risks like the pandemic. The question has been raised many times and have been discussed in the last two days of CBAs are often why then having those practices being scaled up and what are the main challenges for scaling them up and what are the opportunities we have now to scale the solutions up. And I think the next um, panel, we're going to really discuss then how can national and subnational policies help, especially as countries thinking about the policies for building back better from COVID. So we, we will show you hopefully the Mentimeter result uh, uh, now, great, <laughs> thanks. Can you, 
and it's really great. I think in the in the middle, we really see again like indigenous knowledge coming up really strongly, and that also relates to our question how to scale it up, and how we actually harness that, that indigenous people's knowledge, and the importance of resilience. Yeah, and working with different ecosystems, I can see a mangrove forest and some of the much uh, smaller funds coming up. Great. I, we will share the final result with all in the world cloud and keep your uh, good inputs coming. Um, but with that, I just want to introduce the next panel who will take us to that question about the opportunity and the challenges of scaling up and then the how national and the subnational policy can help. And we have three panelists that will be joining us today. Uh, next slide, Jenna, please. So uh, the first uh, is Johnny Zapata Andia, the forestry officer from Forest Farm Facility. Johnny and the Forest Farm Facility has been enhancing the organization and the capacity of local people to improve livelihoods and respond to a diversity of societal challenges, including climate change. Forest Farm Facility also support those local organizations to collectively advocate for better policies. So Johnny, um, if you can probably enable your video and audio now. So based on the story you have heard from communities and the participants just now, could you share some quick reflections to the two questions that she, uh, that's shown on the screen? Jenna, next please. Great. And uh, I know FFF work around the world, but it's, it, I will, we would really appreciate if you can share some insights also from Latin America to complement the other speakers' expertise. Johnny, over to you, please. Thank you, Xiaotin, and also I want to thank to the um, colleagues uh, from the first panel this uh, video from the China Network uh, and the presentation of uh, Nirmal from the Alliance of Nepal, the presentation of Musonda from the Zambia Forest Community Association were uh, really inspirational. I want to um, uh, reflect a little bit on what we have uh, heard and, uh, and seen from this uh, first panel. And I see uh, an opportunity on this collective action to respond to COVID-19 and recovery. And as a challenge that is at the same time an opportunity, this enhancing the capacities of local communities. So let me explain a little bit this, my, my two points. So uh, I don't know if you agree with me, but this COVID crisis has helped us to reflect and see that the, these health issues and climate change are in many ways interconnected. And uh, from the forest and farm facility perspective, I would want to emphasize that uh, for us, this community social capital cohesion, trust, institutions, governance mechanisms inside the organizations have been fundamental for these communities to respond to this COVID-19, but also to adapt to climate change and other shocks. Uh, these elements, to my mind, are very essential for these collective actions. The forest and farm producer organizations are very uh, critical local actors to be uh, on the ground, lasting solution for changes like climate, uh, so economic and social changes. But including this health uh, crisis, these producer organizations can offer services and information enhancing the capacities of their members, as, you, uh, as we have, have seen in this case of uh, the Alliance in Nepal and the Zambia uh, cases of this community association, uh, to keep up uh, their business and livelihoods, also to shape best, better policies. Also, they offer the possibility to restore and sustain landscapes at landscape level. In addition, uh, they could provide solidarity and social support systems between uh, their members. And uh, they manage this traditional uh, knowledge that was mentioned in the first panel and uh, lead also collective responses to the recovery. 
in many cases we have seen in, in Latin America and I also can understand also in other parts of the world, they provide the only organized response to the local needs. And uh, these organized producer organizations, they are setting up already, also not for the future, many innovative initiatives, also in Latin America. They support their members during the crisis, like in communication campaigns in the local language, not only national, also the language that are spoken by the indigenous people and so on. Also innovative logistic and marketing solutions that we have supported in Ecuador and Bolivia. And a specific social and health, and health service for the people who are affected in the, and also people and households. Uh, we have seen in Latin America that this collective action has been keen to keep the virus out from entering to the communities, but also for attending the sick people, sharing available food, growing food locally, finding ways to access market despite of all these lockdowns everywhere, for both, for selling and also for buying goods. We could see that uh, this real and concrete benefits of investing in enhancing these capacities is a very good invest investment. Investing in strengthening these capacities of these local people can deliver sustained improvements to rural livelihoods, boost recovery from COVID, but also build long-term resilience. I want to also to point out following in terms of a scale. We have seen also um, local cases, but to do, uh, to reach a scale is very important. The second and third uh, grassroots organization for, for both purposes. One is for these economies of scales in processing, marketing, procurement, technical services, among others, but also that these organizations are able to influence governmental policies at national, subnational, but also international levels. As for example, for uh, advocating in these stimulus packages, recovery plans of the countries. To finalize, I want to, um, to go to the second question about the policies, and I will try to be uh, shorter. So in the long term, Considering all, all that I, I have shared, a key government policy to respond to all these challenges is to build institutional capacity of these local organizations. Through different kind of technical assistance, trainings, exchanges, but also creating policies that encourage community actions and enterprises. Those policies can be, for example, at national and also subnational level, incentives. What, um, and I want to say one in Latin America said differentiated policies. Not everyone could receive all the same. They should be policies addressing these people. In incentives, governmental procurements, addressing the, the pro products are coming from these uh, producers. Lowing administrative barriers but also making finance available, uh, tailor-made to this kind of person. They don't have uh, the salaries, they don't have properties, they don't have house, but they have many things to offer. And this finance should be tailor-made to them. Great, Johnny. Sorry, just quickly reminding with a little bit lack of time. Um, so we, we can come back to some of the Johnny's really great thoughts. And uh, um, just because of time, it's really great that Johnny, you highlighted how those challenges are integrated, uh, interconnected and the communities experiencing them at all at the same time. So it's good to think about how policy can support those strong community-based collective organizations, which is key for innovation, mobilizing collective actions and the promote integrated solutions for long-term change. And then next, could we move to Mrs. Vanessa Fred, the Assistant Secretary, uh, Secretary of the Division of Marine Resources of the Department of Resources and Development for the Government of Federal States 
of Micronesia. She has supported the engagement of communities in protected area systems at country and regional levels and is an advocate for holistic approach. And before we also invite Vanessa, I just want to remind everyone, Johnny, there's some questions for you in the chat box. Please use the chat box to respond. And all the, also all the uh, participants, please also put in your comments and your reflections to those two questions as well. Okay, with that, Vanessa, over to you, please. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, perfect, thank you. Hello, everyone, my apologies. I will not be activating my video due to bandwidth. Um, so I will continue um, just with audio. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, greetings from Micronesia, and my humble respects to you all. Thank you and the Nature Conservancy for this opportunity to share our story and experiences here in Micronesia. Um, thank you to panel one speakers. I really enjoyed the great examples of how communities are adapting across the world, and especially utilizing knowledge and practices that have existed within their society over the many years. Um, just shortly, I'm, I'm from the island of Yap in the Federated States of Micronesia, which I'm sure many of you will probably Google, um, but I'm now based in Pohnpei, um, also, which is the capital of FSM, and I'm working with the national government on sustainable natural resource use and management. Um, before I provide my response to the questions at hand, I would like to sincerely thank all of my family, mentors, community leaders, colleagues, and teachers, um, those who are no longer with us, and those who are still fighting for a better world for our future generations. All I have learned has inspired, guided, and grounded and shaped the career and life that, I now, that is now my reality. Thank you all as I continue to learn. Um, thanks again for this opportunity. I will now proceed um, to responding to the two questions and I'll just speak to both of them together um, and then we can get into more detailed discussions in the uh, breakout groups. Thank you. So to begin, um, the FSM, is blessed to not have any COVID-19 cases to date. Um, and fortunately that our government reacted when it did and closed our border um, back in March. Um, while we figure out how to best deal with this global situation. Usually as a small island nation, we consider our isolation a challenge. However, in this case, it has been an opportunity. We Islanders have relied on our environment and natural resources, not just for existence, but for economic development and integration that we are still striving to balance and keep sustainable. Climate change adaptation and COVID-19 pandemic are new and we are working to better understand it and how best to utilize what we currently have and use external technical and financial resources to better adapt and cope. There is no substitute for an intact apex functioning environment. National and subnational policies can support communities by integrating state supported livelihood and quality of life components into project level activities. These projects must be centered at the heart of the communities and address the needs that matter most to them, which include making sure that their families are safe, fed, and healthy, with strong and unconditional support from local and state governments. These would include access to clean water and stable water and energy infrastructure, improved community or family levels, sanitation facilities, the opportunity to address um, these challenges and have promote opportunities that include small scale agriculture and aquaculture interventions. 
Once these basic needs are addressed, the communities can focus on traditional concepts and realities of conservation and environmental protection. Natural resources are used primarily for the sake of supporting livelihoods. When basic needs are met, then the discussion and action to protect nature can be seriously addressed and communities can move forward in a progressive manner to address real needs that are in harmony with nature and sustain. Fortunately, our people understand that we must take care of the environment as it has served our basic needs over the years. Needs are involved, evolving based on new lifestyles and expectations. At the same time, challenges and threats are intensifying. Government leadership must understand the capacity of its environment, natural resources, and people to best build on, reinforce, and strengthen traditional knowledge and practices through innovative programs and policies that are realistic, applicable, and sustained into the future to truly build environmentally friendly, resilient communities that are working with nature. This knowledge, this wealth of knowledge must be captured and complemented, supported by data to best inform decision making to address the challenges now and into the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vanessa, uh, for highlighting that local communities actually have deep understanding of the need to work with nature to adapt to the challenges based on traditional knowledge, but so important to ensure and for government to support the, their basic needs. And again, pointing us to the traditional importance of traditional knowledge. Thanks for that. And then last but not least, we have Alfredo Coro, the vice mayor of Sayago Island in the Philippines. He's a champion of partner-driven approach in development, and he has used such approach to ensure more efficient and effective local governance and enhance the local community resilience on his island. So, uh, Alfredo, over to you. Thank you. And, uh, thanks as well to the earlier presentations. They were really inspiring. The basic premise of nature-based solution or any development framework is that it would address the needs of the community. Several countries, including my own, the Philippines, have strong and relevant policies that support nature-based solutions, although not explicitly stated. These policies can already help local governments and communities to better respond to risks like climate change and other risks like COVID-19. The gap is in the appreciation and implementation of policies from the local leaders and therefore the communities they represent. In our experience, the support of NGOs like RARE help us frame the localization of the policies and influencing behavioral change of the constituency. The main challenges we observe in sustaining community champion nature-based solutions are the local leadership embracing owning that nature-based solutions will work for their community. If the local leadership, government, or civil society will not support nature-based solution, it will be hard to implement anything. Access to the science for better decision-making and deciding on the right nature-based solution for, to the community. Science plays a key role in ensuring that we are planting the right flora and nurturing the right fauna. Just because we are nature-based does not mean anything for nature is allowed. Communicating nature-based solution and its benefit to the people. Influencing behavior to accept nature-based solution has to be done regularly and sustainably. Everyone, regardless of age, must co-own the idea that nature-based solution programs will benefit them more. Enforcement of nature-based solution, solutions policies are often challenged and the integrity of the leadership must be consistent. Proper planning helps in avoiding potential violators of laws and policies. Co-creation of innovative solutions in all sectors and public services to align to nature-based solution. Education, health, road development, housing, social protection must be attuned to nature-based solutions to capture rule of government community approach. And lastly, financing nature-based solutions is the hardest part since convincing financing support for various investments 
and NBS currently needs to be very creative. National government and private financing are very limited and in the private sector side, often on CSR initiatives for now. Our experience in the municipality of Del Carmen addressed all of the mentioned challenges and developed an entire public service delivery framework around nature-based solution. The story of a large conglomerate with no business in our community that believed in the idea of carbon sequestration with a 5,000 hectare mangrove forest became our financial ally. The story of Kaub village, whom we empowered the whole community to manage an ecotourism destination employing all 400 families in rotational duties and conditions of improved health, education, and environmental indicators. The story of Mang Jerry, who was very active in all methods of destructive fishing and accepted the nature-based solutions framework after household level discussion of sustainable practices and its benefits. He now participated in our community-based ecotourism program to become a tourist boat operator and marine guardian. The story of Gina, our environmental officer who relentlessly pursued our vision of stopping illegal fishing and illegal mangrove cutting until we achieved 90% reduction in illegal fishing and zero illegal mangrove cutting. All our experiences collectively allowed us to manage through the COVID pandemic, an economic health livelihood crisis in the last six months. We have enough fish and marine resources, even if there was a 150% increase in the number of fisher folks securing food for our families. We are not worried of storm surges since our mangrove forest is vast and wide. In our traditional medicinal practices of sources we can use to address common illness. In totality, climate change, pandemics, and the new normal are, I believe, best managed with nature-based solutions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alfredo. Again, highlighting the importance of partnership, but also reminding us financing sometimes is a big challenge, but it's really exciting to hear some of the good examples of how public and private financing for multiple benefits from nature-based solutions like carbon, ecotourism, fishing, and how important it is to make sure those whatever financing mechanism benefits go to the local communities. And thanks all the panelists. And again, there's a really good uh, chats going on in the chat box and at the same time we also want to hear more from you so we would like to break into smaller groups for now for 30 minutes so we can hear give you all the opportunity also to reflect on two simple questions showing on the screen now Jenna next slide please the two questions are what did you hear from the panels that resonated with you most Please also share why those resonated with you most. Jen, I don't think it's the right slide. And then what did you learn today that will be useful for you to implement in your communities or work beyond CBA? Please also try to explain how you're going to use the lessons learned. And we're just going to post those questions into the chat box in Zoom. Um, because it's having trouble of showing on the slides. And then you will also get those questions from the facilitators once you get into the group. So you will see a join button pop up on your screen shortly and the please click join and then after 30 minutes we'll reconvene in the plenary. So see you in 30 minutes. Charlotte, could you please assign the group please? I think. Great. I think welcome back for those already is back. We hope you had a good discussion. So unfortunately, we're running a little bit short of time. So we wouldn't have a detailed breakout um, back and then we're going to skip the mentee that we have prepared before. But I really encourage everyone to go to the chat box and then share one of the biggest learning that you had from the breakout group today. It can be really short or some keywords, but just really helpful to know kind of what us really resonated with you in the breakout group discussions. And for each of the group, we also have been um, assigning people to take notes. So your rich discussion will be captured some, somewhat as well. So, but at the same time, please do use the chat box to share some of your reflections. Charlotte, are we all back or are we still waiting? 
I think we're all back now. So yes, I think just carry on. Okay, great. So we only have a very few, we actually is at the time, but we do want to uh, use this last few minutes to have a final reflection with all of you. You can see on the slide, we especially want to learn from all of you what's the biggest lesson you learned today that will you will take forward in your community or your work beyond CBA conference. Um, and with that, I want to in, invite back so our excellent speakers to share their reflection on this for under one minute. Uh, and all the participants, again, please feel free to use the chat box to share your reflection. And with that, I just want to invite first Yi Qing Song. Uh, Yi Qing represents China's pharmacy network. She didn't speak, but she was mentioned many times by Xiu Yun in her video as the inspiration for her community to work with nature and diversify their agriculture production system. So Yi Qing, over to you. One minute quick reflection, please. Okay, thank you for the chance. That, uh, if they are the, the biggest lessons, I would like to say the biggest inspiring uh, today for me is that to hear the, the voice from different communities and different countries globally that uh, they are doing this uh, uh, local community actions, uh, community-based adaptations, uh, and give uh, uh, support to the traditional knowledge and the diversified food and uh, medicines. Those are quite uh, uh, inspiring me. And so this is also the big lesson that we, we want to, to further enhance our community based action and community-based adaptation to all the uh, climate uh, changes and the crisis. And this is the big lesson we would like to do. And the second one I want to emphasize here is that uh, uh, for the policy, we did also discuss in the group that uh, we in, in support those kind of communities based adaptation, the policy really need to be more, more participatory, more integrated to address the real need of community support, uh, communities uh, act, uh, collective action. The last one most I think is a very important one is that uh, the uh, communities need to be further uh, collaborated and not networking towards each other and working together at a re uh, local, regional, and even global south uh, levels, working together to adapt to the change, to the crisis. This is the key for the solution. Thank you. Great collective actions and a stressing number. Okay, next in the Mao last on the one minute conclusion biggest lesson for you please uh, it's a really uh, great opportunity to me for to know more about this uh, natural based solutions and um, basically i uh, just uh, mentioned about this uh, uh, closing remark is that how can we cooperate this indigenous knowledge into the scientific knowledge if we can cooperate this uh, in between this knowledge definitely there should there we can go with uh, this uh, natural based solution efficiently in that way and i understand uh, more about this uh, um, indigenous knowledge that can uh, uh, that can fill the gaps over this scientific knowledge thank you great comparing this people's knowledge and scientific knowledge great mm. next musonda please um my one minute is that it is possible to combine traditional knowledge with scientific knowledge. It is possible to repackage the nature-based solutions into acceptable packaging standards by partnering with the Standards Bureau and partnering with universities that focus on research. All this is impossible. All this is possible because the women in the villages who have this knowledge are not writing it or documenting it in any way. So we need to preserve this knowledge and make the best out of it. And also the forests hold everything that we need. So we all need a concerted effort to learn from what the local people know and take it a step forward as a nature-based solution with empirical evidence and marketing strategies. Thank you very much. Great. Again, we're all dependent on nature and then learn also from those local traditional knowledge is important. Next, Johnny, please. Thank you. Uh, 
for the opportunity to to listen this uh, uh, very good uh, stories and also be part of this um, sharing in the panel in the break breakout sessions. And to me, to find the solutions to the current uh, global challenges, we don't need to go to the sky. The solutions are on the ground and, and also are local. The stories that we have heard and all this experience and the discussion today show that strong communities and strong forest and farm producer organizations have proven potential to be both transformational and also sustainable. They need the government and donor investment to enhance their capacities. Thank you, over. Thanks, strong producer organizations, actually strong local collective organizations is so important for everything. And the next, Vanessa, please. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so just lastly, I just want to thank everybody. I learned a lot. Um, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, I think lastly, I just want to reiterate that, you know, we must not forget that we, no matter where we're working for an NGO, for the government, we must always remember that we are part of a community. And that, you know, we understand and we know that our governments have limited capacity and have their own challenges. And so that, you know, we must learn and work together um, and that the community has the leadership and the networking um, and working together can be the best solution and a resilient force in all of these challenges moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, collective actions, um, equitable partnerships and understanding each other's challenges, very important. And Alfredo, um, last words. By, by one minute. Uh, first, thank you for the opportunity that you allowed us to share our story and for the other uh, groups that shared the stories. Uh, for me, it's really focused on local governments and local communities. And by focusing on them and capacitating them with the right science, the right science, uh, teaching them how to communicate the way what we're doing now, how to share their own story so that people would be inspired and would, would listen what they have done and that it can be replicated. And lastly, it's about leadership. And the leadership has to understand that nature-based solutions and communities are key. We mean national leadership and local leadership both. They have to start appreciating the value of indigenous technologies, the value of um, the role of communities of, of every actor in, in, in our society can contribute to building a better community for all of us. Thanks. Perfect note to end on. We need to keep telling our stories and uh, work together. And uh, uh, many of you here are the leaders to make the change actually happen. And I just want to thank those people who also share some really good examples in the chat box. For example, Agricourt's new tool for risk assessment and designing adaptation activities in the forest sector. Please do have a Check and do check those chat box. Um, and thanks to all of you for a very informative and a constructive discussion. Sorry for some of the tech glitch, but I hope you still enjoy the session. I definitely did. And unfortunately, we have run over eight minutes, but we hope we can continue the discussion through the CBA online platform. For example, you can go to the Flickr album and view more stories from communities. They keep telling their stories and you can add your reflections and add your story there as well. You can continue the discussion on the chat section under the session on Hoover platform. You can arrange meet up with speakers and people you met in the session, which you haven't really had a chance to discuss, but you want to network with them. You can also find all of us in the participant list. And now you all know our name and send us messages if you have any feedbacks on the session or any further queries. So we hope to continue to hear from you and learn from you beyond this session and beyond CBA. With that, we'll officially close the session and thanks everyone for your time.